Hi. In our first video on magnetohydrodynamics, I had promised that we were building a much larger, more powerful magnet assembly to improve the performance of our MHD pumps to allow us to construct a system to generate electricity from seawater as well as be the first stage in our railgun project. So it occurred to me that the building of this large magnetic assembly is interesting in itself. And what I'd like to do is go through some of the principles, the design, and then the very interesting process of inserting these enormously powerful magnets into the assembly. If you'll remember from the first video, I had this little channel built to allow us to pump liquid and generate a little electricity. It was based on an N40 neodymium magnet that's identical to the one that I have here outside of the assembly. If you take a look at this Gauss meter that I have up here, turned on here, and I take the probe and I hold it next to the surface of the magnet, for an N40 magnet, this is a typical field strength outside of its coating and a half a millimeter or so away. And you'll notice that the 254 millitesla decreases very quickly as I begin to move away from the surface. As I pull the probe up, you'll see how it goes down, goes up, goes down. And if I move it laterally away from the center position, you'll notice it also very quickly drops off. Now what's happening here, I'll show you on this drawing, is that the magnet field lines are strongest as they leave the poles, simply because the billions and billions of tiny little magnetic domains that exist within the magnet want to form closed loops from their north to their south pole. And because they're packed together in the magnet here, the intensity of the magnetic field is represented by the density of these field lines. At the poles, they are strongest. At the center, it's the strongest. As you begin to move away from the surface, these field lines tend to pull away from each other as they're trying to make their way down to the southern end of this magnet. Two axioms that we will just uh, assume for this point, we can look up the details or you can if you would like to, are that magnetic field lines do not cross. They can be compressed together and they can spread out, but they do not cross. And the second one is they generally don't like each other. They tend to pull apart from each other. So as soon as the field lines move away from an area where they're constrained to try to get to the north pole of these micro domains, they begin to spread out and move apart. And that, as we see, the field decreases as we move laterally and it decreases as we move vertically. Now that's a problem because in this channel, what we were seeing is that all the pumping action was probably occurring within a fraction of a millimeter of the surface of that magnet. The upper area, a centimeter or so above there, the weakness of the field meant we were probably getting a lot of vortices, a lot of inefficiency. Not such a good way to produce a magnetohydrodynamic pump. If you want to produce a much stronger field, a more homogeneous field, and relatively inexpensive to do, is simply to build a two magnet gap. Although this looks like a magnetic yoke, it is not. This is aluminum. It's not ferromagnetic. Stainless steel fasteners. There's nothing in this structure other than as a support for two of the exact same type of magnets that we demonstrated here before. But the difference, if you see with the Gauss meter, is that if we place the meter in between these, this gap and we put it down on the surface, you can see that instead of the 250 odd that we had in the previous example, we're up to almost twice the field strength in between the gap. And if you look, as I raise this up between the two poles, I'll try to line this up with the camera a little better, and you look at the meter at the same time, you'll notice there's almost no decrease in the field either. I mean, there's a little bit, but there's very little. And if I move laterally out here, it's almost as strong. So almost no decrease in strength. If anything, a slight increase as you move laterally and almost no decrease through the entire volume. So just for the price of an additional magnet, you can double the field strength and probably increase the volume of the field strength of the, that field by as much as eightfold. What's happening here, and you can see this on the diagram, is effectively the field lines that are coming from the North Pole here want to try to find a South Pole. 
but they are promiscuous. They don't care whose south pole. And because the magnet above it is so close, these field lines can make a nearly direct connection here and don't tend to spread out as much. Nevertheless, there is, this drawing isn't perfect, and there is a bulging and a distortion because as you get near the edges of the magnets, this field line sees the upper pole here. But it also isn't that far from its, its southern end down here. And so the bulging of the field here decreases the potential strength of the, of the magnet. So if we want to increase the magnetic strength even more, what we have to try to do is hide these poles from the gap. And the way we do that is we will essentially conduct the field lines that would be going around here and trying to pull this field out. To do that, we build a yoke. Now, as I said, this is not a magnetic yoke, but we can build a poor man's version of this by simply taking some plain steel and constructing a little magnetic yoke right in front of your eyes. This is plain steel, nothing magnetic or fancy about it. But if we put these pieces of steel here and we take our probe, as we did before, and we put it in between. Remember we had almost 500, not quite, like 480. And you can see that the field strength is not only extremely homogeneous across the gap, it's very homogeneous as you move laterally as well, and it's stronger. Now the increase here doesn't seem all that tremendous, but that has to do with the fact that this is not an optimized yoke. And what do I mean by optimized yoke? What's happening when we are trying to guide the magnetic field away from here? We're taking advantage of the fact that ferromagnetic materials, just like the magnets, are made up of billions of small little tiny magnetic domains. And if placed in a magnetic field, they will line up north to south, north to south, and can guide the field lines through them. So if we do this example here where we take this magnet and we place it near these ball bearings, these are actually a fairly low magnetic stainless steel, but nevertheless they will be affected by the magnet. You can see that they're pulled in toward the magnet, but notice how close we have to get. Probably two centimeters or so before they start to really react. However, if I take this piece of steel and attach it here. Now place this steel close to the balls. I can affect the balls at a much greater distance. Not with the same strength as putting the magnet next to there, but much farther away than I would be able to do if I take the rod off. Like that. So what's happening here, if we look at the diagram, is with this rod attached, what's happening with the field lines is that the magnetic field lines are still traveling out of the sides of the magnet up here, but they're being guided to the end of the tip there where the balls are, and effectively it's distorting the magnetic field in such a way that it's going here and it's going here, and that's how we affect the balls at a much greater distance when we place this magnetic rod here. Now one of the properties of any kind of a yoke material is called saturation. This can only handle so many magnetic field lines. Different metals have different saturation levels, but dollar for dollar, plain steel is probably one of the best choices for a yoke because its saturation level is fairly close at about one tesla to the magnetic strength or the magnetic field density for the pole pieces of N40 to N52 magnets. So you want to essentially produce a yoke that has a cross-sectional area of steel guiding the field lines that's proportional or equal or slightly greater than the surface area of the poles that it's guiding the magnetic field lines from. Now in the large yoke that we're building over here, we're following pretty much that same guideline. This large magnetic yoke is sort of what's called an H design or a box design. We have heavy steel plates, four of them bolted together. We have a small groove milled in the center of each of these plates, the same thing at the bottom too. This guides the magnets which fit into this little groove here. The magnets we are using are N52, one by two by three inch, same as these one, two, three blocks. And the magnets effectively will sit in this groove and slide all the way along here until you get all the way to the other end. At the other end, there's a small keeper 
that is bolted into the end of the block, screwed down there to keep the magnets from just squirting out at the end when we push them all the way in. There'll be three magnets, one, two, three, and there'll be three magnets on the bottom, one, two, three, each one kept in by this little keeper here. The aluminum blocks here are simply fixtures that are going to be used to hold the apparatus that we intend to place in between the mag magnets that we're putting in there. And this will just keep the load of all the forces that are going to be present inside the magnetic uh, yoke from pushing on the actual magnets themselves. So these things have nothing to do with the magnetic properties of the yoke. These are just structural. In addition to that, this is just a temporary loading block with a slight step down so that when we push the magnets in there, they don't catch on the front end. The forces involved with 600 pound magnets being pushed into this yoke and mean that we're going to grease the uh, trough to make it easy to insert the magnets. Finally, once we've put three magnets in one side, then we will flip the entire assembly over and we will repeat the process. This piece of acrylic will be sitting between the magnet layers just in case things go a little sideways. They're not able to go really sideways because the forces here can break fingers and explode magnets and we want to be very careful. This is simply acrylic so we can kind of see what's going on inside there. So that's pretty much the layout of the block. If you go over to Applied Science where Ben has done a very good video, his most recent video, he shows an example of what's called a C yoke magnetic block. There's no reason why this has to be a symmetrical flow of magnetic field lines, just sufficient metal to guide the field lines around. And a C uh, yoke is more common because it gives more access to the inside of the magnetic field for experimentation purposes. For our purposes, we're perfectly happy with a long, structurally sound trough for what we're going to be using this for. So this H type of block is a little less common. So I'm going to get everything set up and we're going to try to see if we can load this in without getting hurt. See you in a sec. All right, now we get to the scary part of this whole process. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grease the channel to minimize any friction from the high loading of these magnets. So I'm going to put some lithium grease in here. I'm going to drag it around into the channel where the magnet's going to go. All the way to the end there. Make it nice and slimy. Doesn't hurt to do the walls a little bit. All right. Now we'll get the grease out of here. And I'm going to take one of my first magnets and we're going to push it in between there. We're going to take this acrylic plate and put it in the gap simply to keep things from going sideways if they want to go sideways. This is the magnet that we're going to be putting in here, 600 pound pull neodymium N52. So when I put this, I can already start to feel it pulling to the block here. So I have to make sure that I get it into the guide and well positioned before it has a chance to free up. And then it's going to pull itself in there very powerfully. Now if I look carefully, I still see the S is up so it didn't flip. And that was important. And now what we're going to do is we're going to push it all the way to the other end using my non-magnetic wooden bar. Good thing I greased it. <clears throat> Notice how I had to clamp the entire assembly down and then clamp the assembly to the table and then lock the t everything down to a three quarter ton table just to get this to work. That was number one. Next magnet, same polarity, S up. Now, we're going to guide this in between so it doesn't go sideways and expect it to do its kind of wild let go here. And that's scary. Those are forces. And I think we still have the same polarity. I don't see how it could have possibly flipped. So now we're going to push this fella in. Now, normally it'd be almost impossible to put these two magnets close to each other. But the point is, the yoke guides the field lines that would normally oppose them. And so it's much easier to move them close to each other. Whew. Easy is a relative word though. All right, let's get another magnet. Same thing, gotta be very careful as we get close to the metal. Don't let it take off until the last minute. 
and then it takes over. Now we'll take my little pusher. Good. Okay, now we have to secure these magnets so that they're not going to be popping out of here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to release these clamps so I can move this base plate a little off the end of the table. Another interesting thing too is that the yoke contains the magnetic field pretty effectively. It doesn't stick. Nice, huh? Makes it safer to work with. What we're going to do is pull this off the edge of the table sufficiently so that I can get to this little hole here where I'm going to secure the stop in the end of the magnet. I'll pull out my little plate, put my screw on the end of this. So if you see what I'm going to do here, if you look in the end of the magnet yoke, insert the screw up through there. And the idea is I'm going to put this little this keeper on the end. It's sort of a spacer nut and screw this in place. I'll move my hand as soon as I can. And what that's going to do is support that so that the magnets can't come out. Later on we'll be inserting a smaller magnet in there just to fill up the remainder of the gap. Now the trick is we have to flip everything around so that we can repeat this for the other side. Alright, now the other side. So let's do our greasing thing. Get the trough nice and slimy. Go ahead and we'll start here, I guess. And we'll just start greasing it up all the way to the end. Saves muscle power. I'm going to take my acrylic safety guard, put it in between the guides here, slide it in. And now I'm going to grab magnet number four. In this case, we're going to make sure that we have the south poles down. So here goes. Oh boy, I can already feel it pulling. Man, that goes in there. Now if you look, you can see that it pulled itself a little further in because of the other magnet. But it likes the steel better than it likes the magnet that's about a centimeter and a half away. And that's what we're depending on to keep the magnets in place. Nevertheless, I need to get this magnet farther down. So I'm going to have to push it. I think I need more grease or more muscles. I think I got this to the other end. Yep. And now we're going to be more liberal on this grease. All right. Let's go ahead and slime this up. Each magnet probably cleans out the grease and makes it a little less slippery for the following magnet. So we're going to help it. Now magnet number two, south pole down. I don't like this part. Frightening. Let's go ahead and get our pusher and shove it in a little further. All the way up to its buddy. All right, one last magnet. South pole down. All right, the part I hate is just scary. 
Boom. All right, looks like it lined up pretty well. I don't think I'm gonna be able to push it in any further. And like I said before, in this remaining gap between this magnet and that keeper, we've got a couple of shorter magnets on order that are gonna fill up that final gap. And that'll be loaded in just like you saw those, but that will then complete the entire 14 inch or uh, what would that be? 35 centimeter channel between the two blocks. But as I said before, one of the neat things about this is it contains the magnetic field very effectively. You can barely get that buddy to stick. So the saturation of this metal has not been overtaken by the, uh, the strength of the magnets. And that's kind of a nice thing because then this is a lot safer to keep inside of a, uh, a laboratory or a shop, even though it's got a tremendous magnetic field in between. So in a little while, we'll be producing the videos that are gonna be utilizing this magnet for all those purposes that I described early on in this, in this video. So I wanna thank you very much for watching and please subscribe, it helps us a lot and you have a wonderful afternoon.